So hello everyone and welcome back to Top Tips for Archaeology Graduates. Um, I'm joined today by Dr Lisa Ludwig, um, who is an archaeobotanist and she's going to tell us all about how she got into the fascinating world of archaeobotany. So Lisa, um, could you tell me a little bit about how you got, you know, what is your current job role and what are some of the things that archaeobotanists do? Sure, um, so my current role is a postdoc research fellow um, in Oxford. So um, I'm broadly researching farming practices in the Roman period um, in Northwestern Europe. And my main kind of research technique is archaeobotany. Um, so this means I spend quite a lot of my um, time at the microscope, sorting samples, identifying um, plant remains. And then I'm applying a stable isotope analysis to um, these materials. So I prepare and then analyze um, the seeds and cereals. Um, and then I also do um, data analysis of this material and previously published data sets. And then as part of um, the research, of course, I, I write up this work into journal articles, um, do conference presentations, um, do some teaching here and there, um, attend workshops, meetings, that kind of thing. So it's about kind of 80% my own research and then 20% kind of other activities. Um, and then in terms of what is archaeobotany, um, essentially it's the study of ancient um, human plant relationships through the analysis of archaeological plant remains. So most commonly um, this means plant macro fossils, which is basically any bits that you can see with a naked eye. So seeds, grains, uh, nutshell, chaff, that kind of thing. Um, but it can also mean plant microfossils, which are things like phytoliths, starch, pollen, which you need high power um, microscopy to, to um, identify. Um, so whilst traditionally it involves a lot of um, microscope work, so sorting and identifying materials, um, increasingly it involves a much wider range of methods, so both um, destructive kind of biomolecular analysis, um, largely carbon and nitrogen stable isotope analysis, um, but also increasingly things like morphometrics, um, SEM work, um, and kind of increasingly um, more kind of like data analysis and theoretical interpretation. So it's a pretty kind of broad range of research tools at the moment. Yeah, so it's really diverse. So archaeobotany, that one word, covers like a whole range of different kind of uh, research types and different materials to be studied. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And depending kind of where and when you're working on, it can involve, you know, like desiccated camel poo from Egypt or like um, carbonized cereal grains from like a military site on Hadrian's Wall. Um, and you can answer, you know, really different questions depending on if you're looking at domestication or like hunter-gatherer societies or medieval gardens or like Roman religious life. So yeah, it's, it's, it gives you a huge, hugely broad range of skills to kind of like do archaeology with. That's fascinating. Thank you. So how did you get into archaeobotany? I guess what attracted you to it? And then how did you get into your specific role? So what's your biology? <laughs> Okay, so what, what attracted me to it was that I was always interested in the more kind of everyday parts of, of human life in the past. So how people farmed, what they ate, how they prepared their food, and kind of how all those activities kind of organise and structure kind of communities and interactions with the landscape. Um, so in my undergrad degree, I was really into farming. I was like, this is fantastic. Um, and I was doing my undergraduate dissertation with Amy Bogard, who's a fantastic archaeobotanist in Oxford. And I was like, this is fantastic. So whilst I wasn't doing microscope work in my undergrad, I was like, this is great. I want to learn more later on. Um, my first fieldwork experience was also pretty formative. So my first ever fieldwork um, outside of Britain was in Herculaneum in Italy, That's where so we cool. were processing the contents of a Roman sewer. So we were doing um, flotation and then sorting through um, Roman sewage, essentially. So we were picking out amazing things like fig pips, um, cucumber seeds, kind of black pepper, and as well as um, other environmental materials like fish bones, eggshell, um, animal bones. So it was a real kind of amazing introduction to what environmental archaeology 
um, can be. So yeah, it was really by the end of undergrad, I'd realised that this is the part of archaeology that I want to focus on. Um, and that's when I decided to go on and specialise at postgraduate level. So you didn't actually have any kind of microscope experience for your undergraduate degree. It was something you developed later yeah. on. Yeah. So I hadn't, no, there's no, we, well, there's no formal training. There was bits and pieces in um, practical classes. But aside from kind of flotation and sorting of residues on fieldwork, I hadn't done any at microscope experience. So yeah, it, it's definitely something you can develop at master's level. Yeah. And then you went on to do your master's. Yeah, so um, I did a master's in European archaeology, I think was the title. Um, but it, I basically chose options in um, practical archaeobotany. So that was all of the kind of theory and method behind how archaeobotany works. And um, we did some really cool um, uh, write-ups on um, doing a kind of like data analysis of material from a lakeshore site in Switzerland and then also kind of like a longer form piece about um, farming transitions in the Roman medieval period so that was fantastic and then I did a dissertation on um, the archaeobotanical evidence for the uh, Iron Age Roman transition at a site called Silchester so I was looking at my own um, samples in the lab and learning to identify material um, and that was really really fun so and that's kind of what spurred me on to continue to do um, PhD research on the subject. Mm. So did you go straight from a master's to a PhD? Yeah, so I did. Um, I think part of that was at the time, it was the years after the first financial crisis. So there wasn't really many opportunities in commercial, well, no, no opportunities to be honest. So yeah. um, I applied for funding and I was fortunate to receive it. Um, so and that's why I carried on. Um, so I don't really have any <laughs> regrets, but in hindsight, I think, doing a few years in commercial definitely gives people a lot of kind of practical experience and understanding where your archaeobotanical samples come from and the kind of, um, you know, the depositional processes and the issues of sampling and processing, that's all so important for mm -hmm. interpreting the material. Mm -hmm. um, so whilst I didn't, I think having some time in fieldwork is like hugely useful for being a really good archaeobotanist. Yeah. And then you went from your PhD to your postdoc. And yeah. then um, do you hope that you'll be going into academia once you finish your postdoctoral research? Yeah, so um, hopefully, yeah, no, I'd love to stay on in academia. Um, I really enjoy researching and teaching. Um, and there's, you know, so many really cool <laughs> research questions, especially in age of Roman archaeology, which um, are yet to be addressed. Um, but that said, um, it's a tricky business, so I'm, you know, would equally be happy going into commercial. And increasingly, um, people in commercial are still able to to do research, and funding is increasingly flexible. Um, but yeah, so after completing my PhD, I was fortunate enough to move to the University of Reading. So I worked as a PD, well, postdoctoral research assistant for three years. Um, so I was working on two big projects, one um, excavation project, so the Silchester projects. So I was doing more archaeobotany, um, writing up reports um, and monograph chapters. And then I was also working on the rural settlement of Roman Britain project. Um, so um, that was a huge project collating um, excavation reports, largely from developer funded excavations in Roman Britain. So really using all of the wealth of information from commercial archaeology. Um, so I was doing a lot of research, so finding reports, entering them, doing an analysis and writing up and working as part of a big team, which was all really enjoyable and really, really useful experience. Mm -hmm. um, and then now I work independently as a postdoc research fellow, but of course I have lots of different collaborations and kind of keeping up with colleagues doing different bits of research. Thank you. So uh, archaeobotanists are found across different areas of archaeology then not just within the university but you mentioned that people might go and work in commercial where else might we find archaeobotanists working in archaeology yeah so um in britain there's about what 30 or so archaeobotanists in commercial there's a few in um historic england so they have um a team down at port cumberland who kind of act in advisory roles um you also get archaeobotanists who may, may have gone into museum work 
or um, there's quite a few who work freelance doing both um, microscope work, but also doing kind of other heritage roles. And they may be working with um, kind of different heritage or environmental organisations, such as like national parks or conservation charities and kind of using their kind of quite unique insights into like people and the environment and feeding it in, into kind of different different forms. Um, but yeah, and then archaeobotanists also work internationally. So now pretty much every country now has archaeobotany as part of um, routine archaeological excavation. So yeah, and there's really like tons of, of opportunities. Thank you. So I'd like to ask you now a little bit about how your archaeological degree has helped you both kind of like specifically in terms of the knowledge that you gain, but also yeah. some of those other transferable skills that you gain through your degree. Yeah. So um, I did archaeology and anthropology for my undergraduate, um, which was really great because it, it, it really kind of spanned the range of, of kind of like qualitative research questions. So like think reading like different theories and different perspectives and thinking through kind of what they mean and how they affect how we interpret the past. And then also doing like quantitative stuff with um, data and reports and writing that up. Um, so I think it gave me a really useful way to kind of delve into like a new area, like kind of every other week mm -hmm. and then kind of like read, digest and then come up with, with kind of my insight, which I think is a hugely useful um, skill like across any career. And then in terms of a dissertation, I did um, a really nice dissertation on um, art marks, so plow marks or Neolithic and Bronze Age sites in Britain, which is incredibly niche, but it was so, so useful from like taking you through the whole kind of um, process of research design, right? So coming up with a question, figuring why it mattered, finding your data set, um, figuring out how to interpret, and then coming up with a finished kind of written document I think it just gives you like a lot of confidence in, in figuring out how to tackle a question and like all the different skills of working with data, like be it numbers or images or maps. Um, and then pulling it all together into a convincing argument is, yeah, hugely useful. And I'm still passionate about the importance of art marks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's great thank you so much thank you so finally our final question for today mm -hmm. is what kind of advice would you give to students who think they're interested in archaeobotany who would like to go on and research and work in this field yeah um I think if possible it's great to do options which cover the more kind of scientific landscape um end of archaeology so something that gives you some kind of handle on using quantitative numbers um it doesn't have to be archaeobotanical in nature but just being able to like make a graph think about sampling strategies think about hypotheses that would be super useful um gaining field work experience or kind of museum or lab based experience is really good so anything that widens your understanding of kind of sites formation processes um excavation techniques that's all super super useful and then for archaeobotany, of course, it, it's plants that we're, we're looking at. So if kind of on the side, you can, you know, do some reading, maybe go along to some um, natural history <laughs> society mm -hmm. lectures. It's not exactly the coolest thing. Well, plants are becoming increasingly cool in my mind. Mm -hmm. yes. um, but yeah, anything to kind of give you that insight into plants and um, Vegetation communities would be really cool. And there's so much more material um, online now. So organizations like the BSBI, um, the Field School. With the BSBI. Yeah, so the Botanical Society for the British Isles. It's okay. like the peak place for plant um, knowledge in Britain. Um, yeah, so there's loads of opportunities online and that will give you a really solid um, knowledge base for kind of knowing you know how plants work how we identify them which should really give you a great springboard going forward and when you're on excavation or if you're working um for a commercial unit any opportunity to you know do the flotation help with the kind of residue sorting it may look a bit tedious <laughs> but it's, it's that's the basic grounding of um archaeobotany right so it's just really good experience and you know, getting to know your soils and your sediments and mm. how a flotation tank works is all like super useful to know. Yeah. 
I've been on several sites where knowing how the flotation tank works so that you can repair it has turned out to be really yeah. important. <laughs> yeah, no, no, absolutely. Email fiddly pieces of kit, but it's yeah. also really good um, if it's really hot and you want a break from the sun. Yeah, the yeah. flotation tank is a very desirable place to be, more so like in the Med than Britain, but yeah. you know, it's, yeah. Thank you, thank you. So um, if someone uh, wanted to go on and, and study archaeobotany um, for their master's level, would you have any places that you recommend or any, say, organisations you'd recommend they join or things like that? So in terms of places, um, there's quite a few fantastic um, universities doing archaeobotany focused um, courses, or at least courses where you can pick a lot of archaeobotany based options. So um, in Oxford, there's a great group, um, a great research group with Amy Bogard and Mike Childs, which is great. Um, in UCL, Doreen Fuller and his group do a lot of research on kind of Southeast Asia. Um, and then in um, Ireland, Mariel McClatchy at UCD is great, um, doing some great work there. And then more broadly, places like Groningen, um, Basel, um, uh, Moderna, yeah, there's quite a few places. So the places online so there's the international work group for paleo ethnobotany so that's the international organization so their website um has lots of links to previous conferences and it'll give you a great idea of what groups are out there and what everyone is doing um and then more Brit british focused there's the archaeobotanical work group which is organized by historic england and they have meetings kind of once or twice a year, and that's our main community for people doing archaeobotany in Britain. And Ruth Pelling at Historic England convenes that, so she's a, a great point of um, information. Mm -hmm. And then there's also the Association for Environmental Archaeology, which acts as an international group for environmental archaeologists, which archaeobotany is a part of. So yeah, you can join that um, as a student, it's quite reasonable, then you get access to both a journal, um, the newsletters and they have a number of um, meetings throughout the year so that's a great way I found it really useful for kind of meeting people both in archaeobotany and also in allied kind of disciplines yeah it sounds like looking at what kind of research is going on when you want to pick a master's and see where the research is happening that you're excited by and aligns with your interest is a good is a good thing to do yeah yeah, yeah absolutely you need to know what what kind of excites you and what really drives you and whilst you know archaeobotany is essentially counting seeds there's so many exciting new techniques and new new kind of approaches that yeah finding a department when there's a group of people that are really you know doing what you're really keen on is it'll make the whole process a lot easier and you'll learn so much more because it's only what a year for most masters so it's really yeah. important to, to to choose wisely yeah yeah. Thank you so much for joining us today, Lisa. That was absolutely fascinating. I'm happy to be here.